Your Vegas One, news and information 24-7. Students at some of the state's colleges and universities will pay higher fees, while faculty will have merit pay slashed. It's all thanks to Governor Jim Gibbons' demand to slash state budget. The governor says he won't raise taxes, but should students and faculty pay the price? We'll ask University System Board of Regents Chairman Mike Wixom and Chancellor Jim Rogers. That's all next on Face to Face. Tough questions, direct answers. This is Face to Face with John Ralston. Welcome to Face to Face. I'm John Ralston. After months of hand-wringing and catastrophic predictions, the university system has obeyed the governor's edict and begun the painful process of cutting the budget. Hiring freezes are on, job searches are off, and now some students and faculty will help bail out the state. Joining me now, Chancellor Jim Rogers and University Region Chairman Mike Wixom. Welcome to the program, gentlemen. Thank you. You know, I don't even recognize you any, anymore, what? Chancellor. I'm going to show you why. And I'm going to tell you why that is. Because let me show you the guy that we had on face to face on October 17th, right after the governor announced 5% cuts. I said, my God with the amount of money that you're asking for us, it will really hurt us. It will be a stab in our heart. And uh, we're not gonna do that, we can't do that. So who was that? Was that the chancellor who cried wolf? Was, are, are you the chancellor who's capitulating? I mean, who, who are you now? Are you, you know, I mean, uh, you're not the same guy anymore. Oh, I think I'm the same guy. Remember, John, you always have the, the funny way of, of setting forth the facts. We were talking funny? about a... Yeah. <laughs> Peculiar. Okay. All right. Uh, remember, we were talking about a 5% cut at that time with no guarantee on where that was going to go, whether it was going to go from 5% to 10% to 15%. And at 5%, looking down the road, based upon what we thought the shortfall might be, we thought it might go to 10 or 15 percent. It still might, Chancellor. Well, it could. It might. It could. It might you think the economy's getting better? Do you see signs that the economy's getting better? Well, let's not get into that one at the oh. moment. Let me answer your okay. first question, which right. sometimes you don't let me do. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> So what happened with us is that we tried to negotiate the best deal that we could. We took a position that this is what we could or we couldn't do. And then the governor, you know, went from 5% to 8%. And as somebody said to me, well, how much better is 4.5% than 8%? I said it may be five times better. Because at 8%, you're taking the, the meat off of the bone. <clears throat> Uh, and you said stab in the heart at 5 percent. Well, though. it was a stab in the heart. It was a stab in the heart at that point, John, because we were looking forward and we were saying, where does this thing stop? Because if we, if we had given up at that point and we had said, okay, we can do the 5 percent, which would have been a stab in the heart, then a month later we might have gotten a request of, well, now you need to do another 5 percent. We said we've already suffered and we're bleeding to death because of what you've done to us to begin with. Now you've said, well, you did that, then you're bound to be able to do another 5 percent. And I saw that coming and I thought that that was, was not going to work and it wouldn't pass. So 5 percent uh, was the wrong number. Now we know uh, the old saying, every man has his price. Your price is 4.5 percent. We didn't negotiate that. You essentially did. No, I didn't. You're saying, here you go, Governor. I said I'd never give you cuts, but now I am cut away. I didn't cut. We didn't cut. But you've given him a roadmap to do it, haven't no, no, you? No, no, no. Here's what he said. We said, we will not pick the figure. We will not agree to the final figure. You're the one that's going to have to say what that final figure is. But Mike and I don't have the capacity to say, give us the money no matter what. So we said to him, when you decide that you're going to cut off the spigot, then you tell us what it is and we will go back and we will react accordingly. But we are not going to consent to that amount. We're not going to okay. agree to that amount. All right. Well, let me ask you uh, about, about this. Do you think it's going to end at 4.5 percent? I don't know. I hope so. I mean, uh, right now we have to look at the, uh, at the uh, economic uh, predictions. And, and right now no one knows for sure. I hope it ends at 4.5 percent. But you don't have any confidence that it's going to, do you? Not specifically, but I don't have any confidence that it won't either. I just don't know. I, no one knows right now. Well, you know, it's interesting what one of your colleagues uh, had to say when the, at, at the meeting where, where you discussed uh, the cuts and voted on them. Here's what Cedric Creer had to say. He said, I think we've been bamboozled. Those who have voted for Governor Gibbons have been fleeced of their vote. You were one of those. Were you fleeced of your vote? I don't believe so. And, no. and I think you need to, to take, we need to back up and take this in perspective. Governor Gibbons has a, a legislative, a constitutional mandate to balance the budget. 
he had to. I mean, the issue then is at what point in time, or how does he go about doing that? The point that, that Jim and I made earlier was we believe that by focusing in on one half of the state budget instead of all of the state budget, it tended to exacerbate the problems, especially for higher education. The overall point the chancellor has made those look, we've made all this progress. He's called it momentum. He's, he's used other descriptions. To take anything away from that, you're stopping the progress of this university system, which has been in this kind of stasis or going backwards for so many years. Aren't you worried about that? Yes, I'm worried. I'm, I'm, I think everyone's worried. Yeah, we all we share are. that concern. Uh, we've made a lot of progress, and, and, and it hurts. But, I mean, we don't have any choice, so we're going to go forward and do the very best we can. All right, a lot more to talk about on this, gentlemen. And when we come back, we'll see which Jim Rogers is going to be here. Is it the one who's going to get stabbed in the heart, or is it the governor's new best friend? We'll find out when face-to-face -face returns. Welcome back to Face to Face. Governor Jim Gibbs is going to make those budget cuts pretty soon. What's going to happen to the university? Are faculty going to have to suffer? Students going to have to pay higher tuition? We're talking to the chairman of the Board of Regents and the chancellor about that today. All right, let's talk about the, the issue of higher tuition and, and faculty losing merit pay. I would think, I mean, what makes a great university is being able to attract great teachers. Don't you think when all these headlines go out across the country now that you're slashing merit pay, if I'm a professor and I'm thinking about coming uh, coming with uh, one of the system schools, I think, I'm not going there. Well, it doesn't help, but I think you need to keep it in perspective, John. The, the merit pay uh, uh, arrangement was something that the professors who agreed to a merit pay cut all agreed to the merit pay cut. I mean, it's we didn't do a plebiscite or something, but the, the, the faculty senates chimed in, and, and, and there was a representative voice on the part of the faculty, and what they said was, uh, this is an important enough situation that we're willing to give. We're willing to give our merit didn't I, pay. Didn't I see the faculty senate president in the newspaper just uh, just scorching you guys for doing oh, this? Oh, that was you. Uh, UNLV. Uh, UNLV, as opposed well, to some of the other institutions. As if UNLV isn't as an important institution. Oh, no, no, that's not what we're saying. But see, one of the, one of the points that was made in... in, in one, out of, one out of eight. Well, yeah, but, but UNLV gave up merit pay when this happened eight years ago, and, and that was the point that they made. And what we're doing... But that, was, this is the point. I'm sorry to interrupt but, you no, again. But this, we got to get off this treadmill. That's the point Jim Rogers has made back when he was seeing the light as opposed to the 2008 version of Jim Rogers. Uh, I mean, we're now back on the treadmill or we're falling off the back of the treadmill. Every time you make progress, if you cut back, when you're still... Again, I bring this up all the time. People watching this should know. You're not even at 100% of the funding formula. You're at 84, 85%. Well, you're mixing issues. You're talking about a short-term issue and a long-term issue at the same okay, time. Okay, tell me what the difference is. The short-term issue is I have so many dollars and I have to pay my bills. I have to meet payroll. I have to cover expenses. That's what we're doing right now. What you're talking about is a long-term issue. And the long-term issue is going to take at least two or three or four or five or six years to solve. Uh, and so we have to be careful when we're dealing with short term that we don't confuse short term with long term. I agree, but the bottom line is I have to make payroll. I have to, I have to meet the expenses that we have, and in order to do that, we have to make some, some accommodations. It is hard, though, in the short and long run, to separate those two issues because one affects uh, the, the other, mm -hmm. obviously. Uh, Chancellor, your friends over at the Review Journal wrote an editorial about the, your complaints about the proposed budget cuts to higher education. Let me show you uh, what, they, what they wrote. They have a slightly different perspective than, than you do. For months, Chancellor Jim Rogers complained that any reductions in the budgets of Nevada's public <coughs> universities and colleges would have disastrous consequences consequences for students and institutions now and businesses and economy down the road. He warned that campuses will be closed, instructors laid off, and classes eliminated. At one point, Mr. Rogers flatly refused to help Governor Jim Gibbons identify places where system spending could be trimmed. Instead of academic Arm Armageddon, higher education, like every other state agency, will suck in its belly and tighten its belt. And students whose tuition is heavily subsidized by taxpayers likely will have to cover a slightly greater share of their educational expenses through increased fees. To some extent, I understand that part of your job is, is, is to stand up for the university system, and maybe it's like a political campaign. You have to use uh, uh, hyperbole to make a point. Was it hyperbole back then? Are you wor really worried, whether it's tightening your belt, the rhetoric that they use there, or devastation, the rhetoric that, that you use? Are you really worried now about what's going to happen with this system? That you, I mean, you've taken your time to become chancellor, you're not getting paid, and now you're sitting back and seeing it go backwards. Well, I don't know that it's going backwards. As I've said uh, many times, I think we've lost a lot of our momentum. Now, of course, when you're looking at the Review Journal, ne they never bother with the facts. 
Uh, it would have been interesting <laughs> if they had read uh, the 40-page memorandum that we originally sent out uh, describing what would happen at 8 percent. And it was exactly as I had predicted and what Mike, I think, had predicted would happen. Yes. It would be devastating to the, to the system. When the figures finally came out and we did 4.5%, we sent out another 40 or 50 page memorandum at that point saying, all right, Governor, this is your decision. This is what money we're going to have to cut. This is where we're going to have to cut it. Now, had the people at the Review Journal bothered to read that 40 or 50 page memorandum, they would have seen that there is a lot of cutting right down to the bone and that I think that while it may not be a stab in the heart that's fatal, I still think it's a stab in the heart. And I think what it does, John, it sends a lot of messages, and, and you've asked the, the chairman here about that. We have faculty now that are very uneasy who are saying, I came here because I was assured that, I, that there, at least I'd, ha I'd have a level funding going forward. And now, he's actually, and now the state's cutting it, so I'm going to start looking for another job. We know that we've lost three or four administrators at CSN because of this. We know, I mean, I talk to faculty members at the law school and other places who are very uneasy about this. So it has a very chilling effect, and what we're trying to do is to keep that together. But over the long run, John, the fact is that the state doesn't provide us enough money, period. We don't have a formula for funding education. Now, I'm not just talking about higher education. We don't have a formula for funding education over a long period of time. There's no long-term vision is what you're there, saying. There never is. Well, let's talk, it's well, we two years a, at the most. We have to take a break. Let's talk more about that and going forward. And we'll also talk about those tuition prices. They're going up, but maybe they can. The chancellor says that they're very low here. We'll talk about that when face-to-face -face returns. Face to Face with John Ralston, a program presented in partnership with the Las Vegas Sun, Cox Communications, and KLAS-TV. <laughs> Welcome back to Face to Face. I'm John Ralston. We have the Chairman of the Board of Regents, Mike Wixom, and the Chancellor of the University System, Jim Rogers, discussing the plight of the system. Let me ask you, Mr. Chairman, uh, for some time the, the Chancellor said, you know, we should just say no. We're not going to give the governor a roadmap. A lot of people think that the governor is acting precipitously or, uh, uh, to use a, a word that, that, that the chancellor used, unpredictably here. 4.5%, 5%, 8%, 4 4.5%, who knows what's next? Why not drain the rainy day fund? Why not call a special session of the legislature and have a discussion of the future funding of the system, the future funding of the state? I guess my question is, you're a separately elected board. Why not just say no? Why not just say no to the governor? What's the downside of doing that? Well, the downside is the governor controls the money. <laughs> and, and so, so, and so force and we him. can't simply just say no because he controls the money. But you could say, what I'm, what I'm suggesting is this, and, I, and this is a double-edged sword. You could say, no, we're not going to give you a roadmap on how to cut. Now, yep. the danger of doing that is that maybe then he'll cut something worse uh, than, than you think he should cut. But the positive side is we that didn't. you're making a statement. Well, I, I, the point was that the governor really didn't necessarily ask for a roadmap for us. The roadmap for us, the governor gave us a number. It was our responsibility as a board to create. Is it? Yeah, it is. It is. It? It is. Yeah, it is. It's is our it? responsibility, and 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 I've always believed that from from the very beginning of this problem. He writes the checks. Yeah, the governor provides the money. We establish the budget, and we establish how the how the money is supposed to be sent, spent. And so that's our responsibility, and we we took that responsibility, and I think that we met it. Now, wh what we're talking about now, and I think you made the point during the break, is we have to start thinking about what we're going to look like long term, and what we want to be long term, how we choose to fund ourselves long term, and how we meet our what, what we want to become and how we get to where we want to become. And those are discussions that we need to start to have as a board and as a community. This issue of, of, of uh, tuition and increasing tuition, uh, Chancellor, you, you, you said you really don't have much of a problem with that. Let, let me show you the quote that was in the, the, uh, our, our <coughs> editorial. The fact is, tuition in the state of Nevada is just outrageously low. I think students are going to have to be accustomed <coughs> to higher tuition. Outrageously low, me meaning that, that uh, you've survived for way too long without increasing it? Well, survival is not being very successful. You know, you can survive without being successful. Right. And what, I wanted, what I've wanted us to do, and I think all of the board members have wanted us to do, was to start to develop a first-rate higher education system. And it takes a, com a lot of components to do that. Now, 
even if we hadn't had this shortfall and Governor Gibbons had not said you will cut this amount, I would still be in favor of raising tuition because I think we're 48th or 49th and we are not going to be able to compete against the Arizonas and the, the Californias uh, uh, schools and the Utah and New Mexico unless we raise our tuition. So it's coincidental that we're going to have to raise the tuition to pick up the shortfall. But had we not had the shortfall, we would still need to raise tuition to become competitive. Does That's that my position. Does that change, though, the <clears throat> kind of student that you might attract to the university also? I mean, and we know what the enrollment figures are uh, already. They're, they're, they've been going down a little bit, or at least they didn't meet projections, I, I should say it that way. Uh, are you worried about changing the mix of the student body by raising tuition? Well, you know, uh, Mike, uh, Milt Glick at the ASU, or who was at the ASU, said that every time he raised tuition, he got better students because students think that they get what they pay for. Uh, one of the things is we've tried to raise the quality of the students at UNLV and UNR. That's why we raised the grade uh, average uh, that's necessary in order to get in. And what that did was it reduced the population of the school. Then it turned on us and they said, well, the legislature said, well, now your population is reduced. The number of, of faculty we have is not reduced. The, num the amount of light bills that we have to pay, the amount of buildings we have to pay, that's not reduced. But look, now you have fewer students now that you've done what you should have done to begin with, and we're going to give you less money. So we find that we're between a rock and a hard place no matter what we do. It, it, and, and we've got to take a look at that, John, and stop planning for two years. We need to take a look and say, uh, yes, here's where true. we're going for the next 10 or 12 years, and this is the money we need to have in order to be competitive. Well, you're absolutely right. You know what, you and I agree. <coughs> Let me ask you, uh, we'll finish up this discussion of the tuition increases, Mr. Chairman. Do you think it's being applied fairly in the, in the way it's being done in the system? Because you could say that there's some unequal application of this. Maybe you should have done it a different way. Well, first we need to make sure that we've got our, our terms defined correctly. We're not talking about a tuition increase. We were talking about a fee surcharge. And that's very, very different. Those are two different animals altogether. What we did allow the systems to do, the institutions to do, is create their own solutions and to give them the flexibility to solve their problems at an institution by institution basis. Because each of the institutions have different situations. Very different. A, right. uh, very different. So a cookie cutter fix for all of them wouldn't work. And that's why some that's of the... That's what the governor's doing, isn't he? A cookie uh, cutter no. fix? Isn't that what you're saying? No, 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 okay. no, 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 no. That's a Go different, on. different animal. Yeah. But what, what I'm saying... We'll get him to say that later. <laughs> <laughs> what I'm saying is that the situation at UNR is different than the situation at UNLV. And, and, a, and a solution that may work at UNR may not or may not work at UNLV. And so what we wanted to do was allow the institutions the flexibility. And that's why some institutions came back with a fee uh, surcharge and some did not. I want to make sure that that's okay. absolutely clear. But for a successful system to work, and Jim has made this point before, there are really three components to a successful financial uh, 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 formula. One is tuition. One is state funding, the other is, is private donation, and all three have to be part of, a, all right. of this formula. Well, we'll have one more segment left, gentlemen. When okay. we come back, let's talk about that longer-term problem and what you do about it. How do you think beyond just the short term and talk about the long-term health and vibrancy of the university system? Back in a moment. Welcome back to Face to Face. I'm John Ralston. We're talking about the upcoming gov gov gubernatorial budget cuts. It's going to affect the university system. We have the chairman of the Board of Regents and the chancellor here today talking about that. As we were talking about, uh, then we've mentioned it, we've kind of touched on it a little bit, this overall problem of state funding. What do you do about state funding, not just to the university, but how this state uh, is, go is going to look, uh, which I've talked about a lot. Uh, again, in that editorial uh, in, in the Review Journal, they, they, uh, they blast you and, and Mayor Oscar Goodman, who's actually spoken. I'm going to give the mayor credit get that on tape uh, and, uh, and others want to fix the tax structure mr. Rogers mr. Goodman other state Democrats and a handful of Republicans just want more of your money if they were really in favor of a fixed restructured stable or overhauled tax structure they'd be calling for cuts in gaming sales and property taxes to offset any new taxes they hoped to impose. Gentlemen, at some point we are talking about money and we're talking about increased funding, whether it's for education, <clears> lower <throat> or higher, whether it's for health care, whether it's for roads, we need more money. But when you have those kinds of voices out there, Chancellor, uh, and, the, and, the, and the Review Journal I think speaks for a lot of people who say, hell no, I don't want any more taxes, we don't need any more taxes, what are you going to do? Well, first of all, I, 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 I assume that the Review Journal <coughs> speaks mostly for itself. 
uh, because I think that they really don't have the community's interest at heart. And but I've said that many times. I know, but, yeah, but, but don't you think there's a lot of people out there who think that, you know, you guys waste money, government wastes there's money? There's no question about that. Yeah. But somebody like the Review Journal can do that. They can suggest to everyone that there's great inefficiencies, that there are many inefficiencies in the higher education system. I've been there for three and a half years. I haven't found them. And if I can't find them, they probably don't exist. Now, let's, you know, moving forward from that, the point is that I believe that all of that, is, that rhetoric is a smokescreen for protecting their own financial capabilities. You really think that? Well, of course I oh, do. Oh, come They're, on. That's so, that's so cynical, though, Chancellor. Well, I'm cynical <laughs> then. You just, John, you, you know that. You think they just don't want to be taxed themselves? <clears throat> Shocking, isn't it? Is that what you really think? Of and that's course. why they write that? Of course. I, th I think that they're protecting their money, which all goes to Arkansas at the end of the year, that hundred million dollars in profit. So let's get on with what really needs to be done. You see the community leaders like the Terry Lannies and, the, and Oscar and uh, uh, Don Snyder and others saying, look, these two-year fixes don't work because they don't fix anything. We, you know, we, get, we put a Band-Aid on it and we got the same problem two years from now. We need to take a look at the overall structure. Now, I'm no economist, you know that. But I can tell you this, that what we're doing now doesn't work. And unless somebody sits down and says, these are the people who have done well in this state and should pay their fair share, and the money is here. When you take a look, John, and you say, the per capita household income in this state is second or third in the United States, and our education is 49th, what in the world is going well, on there? Let's, let's let we the, need to bring those two together. Let's let the chairman uh, j jump <clears throat> in here. Did you agree generally with what the chancellor's saying here? Well, generally, but I, I think we have, we, have a, we have some work to do before we get to that point. And Senator Raggio, who knows as much or more about the tax structure in this state as any human being alive, uh, sat down, as you know, a few months ago and said, we really need to take a look at what our tax he's structure is. He's a conservative is. Republican. He is. And, 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 and he I says agree it needs it. to be done. Well, what he's saying is, and this is a very significant point and he caught a lot of flack for this and I think unfairly what he's saying is we we, we need to look at our tax structure and I think we do because we keep looking at it well, reaching well, the well, same conclusions we've had so many studies I've been here for, for well, almost 25 years I've seen three or four of these they all say the same thing broaden the tax structure what we've missed is this element two elements really the first thing we need to do and you and I had this discussion with Jim during the break is we need to look down the road and say what do we want to look like as a state what do we want to be what are the trade-offs what do we want to accomplish? And then we have to look at our tax structure and evaluate as a state, does our tax structure allow us to meet those objectives? I'll give you an example. The Las Vegas Convention... Uh, i, I, I got to cut you off. Okay. I'd, I'd love to hear your example, but we are, okay. we are at a time. You know, we're going to fix this state eventually. The three of us together can do it. What do you think, Chancellor? Well, I think there's no <laughs> question about that. <laughs> Gentlemen, thanks for coming on the program. I appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. you. If you want to contact me, you can email me at ralston at vegas.com. Call me at 650-1976. You can also click on a whole bunch of websites. The program Program schedules available lasvegassun.com you want streaming video go to lasvegasnow.com and you can check out everything I do right there on ralstonflash.com on the next face to face congresswoman Shelley Berkeley is jumping on the Hillary Clinton bandwagon what prompted Berkeley to test the strength of her ties to her friends at the culinary union and can Berkeley's endorsement help Clinton win Nevada we'll ask congresswoman Shelley Berkeley about that her recent trip to Iraq, and much more. That's all on the next Face to Face. It's a presidential race that'll change the face of the country. On January 19th, Las Vegas One will take you there as sparks fly in the Democratic and Republican caucuses. 
Start to finish, Jeff Gillen and our team of reporters are covering every angle with the latest race results live. And the I-Team's John Ralston and George Knapp bring you in-depth analysis. Don't miss a minute. You can see it all beginning Saturday, January 19th at 9 on Las Vegas 1 or streaming live on our website, lasvegasnow.com. This January, CNN gives you one last chance to see every candidate before Super Tuesday, a two-night-in-a-row live television event. First, Wednesday night, January 30th, the Republicans at the Ronald Reagan Library with Anderson Cooper. Then, Thursday night, January 31st, live from the Kodak Theater in L.A., it's the Democrats with Wolf Blitzer. Two nights in a row on CNN. Your last chance to see the candidates before Super Tuesday, Wednesday and Thursday, January 30th and 31st on CNN. I started to feel old, but I wasn't old. You don't have to live with hair loss anymore. The doctors and staff at Medical Hair Restoration have helped thousands get their hair and their confidence back. Call now and we'll send you a free DVD package loaded with before and after photos and complete credentials on your local MHR doctor. From there, schedule a private consultation where you'll receive a magnified scalp analysis absolutely free. Call now. This is about the look I had my rookie year in, in Major League Baseball and, and it's just phenomenal. You're watching Las Vegas One. News and information 24.